Welcome to the uh, Spring Faculty Senate uh, Faculty Assembly. Uh, my name is Sal March, and uh, my uh, role as uh, chair of the Faculty Senate is my privilege to introduce our invited speaker, Dr. William Schaffner. As I'm sure many of you know, uh, Dr. Schaffner is professor and chair of the Department of Preventive Medicine and professor of medicine in the Division of Infectious Disease here at Vanderbilt University. Uh, additionally, he serves as the hospital epidemiologist at uh, Vanderbilt University Hospital. Uh, Dr. Schaffner's work has, uh, as you know, focused on all aspects of infectious diseases, including epidemiology, infection control, and immunization. In uh, 2009, he received the James D. Price Award from the American College of Physicians for distinguished contributions to preventive medicine. A bit closer to home, in uh, 2010, uh, he received the Harvey Branscombe Distinguished Professor Award here at uh, Vanderbilt. Dr. Schaffner has worked extensively uh, on the effective use of vaccines in both pediatric and adult populations. He's a strong proponent of collaboration between academic and medical centers and public health and local uh, institutions, as his uh, talk today will indicate. He's a frequent contributor to local and uh, national news media on issues related to infectious disease, immunization, uh, vaccines, and biological weapons. I thought that was kind of interesting. His talk today is titled, uh, Vanderbilt and the Tennessee Department of Health, A Successful Collaboration. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Schaffner. Well, thank you, Sal. That was very generous. And uh, colleagues, it's a delight and a pleasure uh, to be with you. I'm going to tell you uh, a little story today about, as Sal said, a collaboration that has extended over many years between the Vanderbilt University School of Medicine and the Tennessee Department of Health, the state health department. Collaborations between academic medical centers and municipal and state health departments exist, but really close, elaborate, long-term collaborations are rather rare. They're unusual. Vanderbilt and the Tennessee Department of Health have had an over 40-year successful collaboration. How did it happen? And how do we measure success? Well, before I tell you about those two institutions, let me tell you about a third which has had an influence, and that's the CDC. Originally named the Communicable Disease Center, and now you recognize it as the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, located in Atlanta. Why is it located in Atlanta, and how did it come to be? Let me tell you a little bit of that history as a kind of long lead-in to our collaboration between uh, the Tennessee Department of Health and ourselves. I'm going to take you back to World War II and freighter traffic between South America and North America. We were about the Allies, that is, were about to enter a major war in the South Pacific. And a major health hazard in the South Pacific was malaria. The only anti-malarial drug available at the time was quinine. And quinine was a product that was derived, a natural product that was derived from the bark of a tree, the cinchona tree, which grew in South America. South American Chintona bark had to be transported by freighter to North America to be processed into quinine, and German submarines made that freighter traffic hazardous and very uncertain. So with the prospect of malaria in troops in Southeast Asia, it was decided to bring together a group of experts in tropical diseases so that they could work on a synthetic anti-malarial. They were put in Atlanta because it was thought that the South then still was malarious. It wasn't, but that collaboration was wonderfully successful. It created an anti-malarial by the name of chloroquine, which worked wonderfully. And while they were all together, they kept being peppered with questions about all kinds of things having to do with tropical medicine and tropical public health, to which they were wonderfully responsive, such that after the war, it was decided to maintain the institution as a national treasure 
And since they were in Atlanta, they were left there and not brought up into the Beltway. That's why the CDC is in Atlanta. And after the war, in addition to all this expertise that was there, it, it was thought important that the CDC had an epidemiologic capacity, the capacity to actually go out and investigate outbreaks of disease in this country and on request around the world. And so a brilliant, assertive, never in doubt, forceful epidemiologist by the name of Alexander D. Langmuir was recruited to the CDC. And when he arrived, he discovered lots of laboratorians, lots of sanitarians, and no epidemiologists. So he needed field epidemiologists in order to have that outreach, in order to be able to investigate outbreaks of disease. So he and others created what came to be called the Epidemic Intelligence Service. They used the device of the draft, selective service, which obliged all young physicians to serve for two years uh, and gave them commissions in the United States Public Health Service and then brought them in on a highly selective basis, trained them for a month intensively, and then kept some in Atlanta and sent others out to state and local health departments as liaisons in order to investigate outbreaks of disease. These people were called Epidemic Intelligence Service Officers. Epidemic Intelligence, intelligence in the sense of gathering information about epidemics. And so many of us, myself included, were recruited to, uh, to be part of the Epidemic Intelligence Service. I was sent to the State Health Department in Rhode Island and had the opportunity to investigate outbreaks of disease both in this country uh, and abroad. Coming back after my EIS experience, having been offered a faculty position at Vanderbilt, I wanted to establish a relationship because I'd had such a good time and I thought that work was so important with the State Health Department. I contacted them and I don't have time to tell the whole story and all of its elaborateness, but to make a long story short, I was gradually and then finally accepted as a consultant to the State Health Department. And at that time, my Vanderbilt chief, the chief of medicine, Dr. Grant Little, had a conversation with me and what he said was, you know what you're doing here, Bill, is unconventional, but he gave me permission to do it. I was young then. I thought that that was kind of straightforward, and only in retrospect do I realize what a wonderful gift and what a wonderful affirmation that that was. Part of what reassured him was that not only were we doing investigations that would get published and be credible as part of product scientific and medical in the medical literature, but we were also training subsequent EIS officers who were assigned to the Tennessee Department of Health, and I became one of their co-supervisors. This has been now a long tradition, and I would like to now demonstrate that working with EIS officers in a training capacity, that the investigations of outbreaks of disease can be instructive and can even lead to national policy changes, all in the context of training young EIS officers. Now, investigation of outbreaks and doing rigorous investigations in that context is a little different than the way we normally do it, where we think of a problem, devise a protocol, submit that protocol for funding, and when the resources come in, go ahead and do the investigation. The way it works with public health is that it's really like working in the public health emergency room. The phone call comes in on Friday afternoon and you've got a problem. You send the EIS officer out to investigate it and you design your investigation on horseback, as it were, as you're riding toward the problem. And the trick is to do that sufficiently rigorously so that you can actually get useful information that advances knowledge. And so what we'll talk about today very quickly is a large epidemic of hepatitis A in Memphis and the question before us is, 
Can we stop it? The EIS officer was Dr. Alan Craig, who's gone on to uh, leadership positions in public health subsequently. Hepatitis A is an intestinal virus. It's spread very readily, prim primarily from child to child. The children may be asymptomatic, that is, have no symptoms at all, or only be mildly symptomatic, so that they may be not recognized as seriously ill. But when they give that infection to their parents, or Uncle Susie and Uncle Tom, they can become seriously ill, quite jaundiced, require hospitalization, and occasionally uh, even be in the hazard of dying from this infection. So that there is transmission from child to adults, and it can happen very quickly. Back in the day, the epidemiologic characteristics of hepatitis A were that susceptibles would accumulate in a community, the virus would be introduced, and then over a period of years, as you will see in the first part of the slide, you would have large outbreaks that would extend and basically exhaust most of the susceptibles often in the inner city. Large impact on illness in a community, hospitalization, and it can go on for a long time, and it was very, very resistant to every effort that public health made to try to curtail the outbreak. Over here on your right, you will see the large outbreak that occurred in Memphis that we're talking about. So we discovered very quickly, we, that is Dr. Alan Craig, at the point that this was a large outbreak. It was located essentially, localized essentially to the inner city. And we had, at that time, a new possible intervention. Because a new, highly effective, very safe vaccine against hepatitis A had just been licensed. And so the, the concept was, could we implement a mass immunization program that would curtail this outbreak and interrupt transmission of the virus? Had not been done before on a large scale. Fortunately, vaccine was available freely from the CDC because they had purchased a stockpile of vaccine to use in the event of an outbreak just like this. The CDC has an advisory committee on immunization practices that makes policy. They had looked at this vaccine and they had said, the way we're going to implement that this vaccine is exactly in this circumstance. We won't give it to everyone routinely, but we will use it in order to curtail outbreaks. So this was an apt opportunity. We made the call. We got free vaccine. And then the entire population of Memphis and everyone pertinent, the newspapers, the television stations, the radio stations, particularly the radio stations that had audiences in the inner city, um, the physicians, all were in favor of this mass campaign, and one was conducted. Couldn't have been done much better. And over 24,000 children were immunized, well over half of the designated target population. In a large immunization effort, that's considered really not very bad. And then Dr. Craig did a careful assessment of the impact of this vaccine. And we were profoundly disappointed because we were able to document little measurable effect on transmission. Now there are a number of reasons for this. Because cases are asymptomatic among children, the epidemic is always beyond where you think it is. There's slow recognition and tracking of the outbreak, and it takes time for public health to get itself organized and spurred into action although it's unlikely that it could have been done much faster by any other public health jurisdiction. Well, that's a disappointment. <laughs> but this information was presented to the CDC's Advisory Committee on Immunization Practice, and we have just told you their first recommendation on licensure of this vaccine was to use it in epidemic curtailment. But as this information was presented to them, this and some other information, but this was the driver, they said, you know, that was our strategy, 
it could not have been implemented any better, and it didn't work. So they had the good sense to reconsider their recommendations and what they recommended secondarily as a consequence of this outbreak, a new recommendation. Rather than wait for an outbreak, we're now going to immunize all the kids in this country. That's what we'll do. We'll just make it part of the routine, universal immunization schedule for all children. So that was the word. Now, what was the result? Ah, this is the sort of graph that warms the heart of everyone in public health. You can see hepatitis A in all age groups, but keep your eye on the solid line. That's children under age five, where most of the vaccine was directed. You can see it's cruising along until there's an introduction of vaccine. And then you will see that solid line plummets to very, very low levels. And if the graph were extended to today, it, the, the line would be even lower. Hugely successful. But wait, look at all the other lines of older age groups. Those are age groups that were not vaccinated, but the occurrence of hepatitis A in those age groups plummeted simultaneously. You know, hepatitis A is spread among children asymptomatically, and then they bring it home and give it to the adults around them. Well, if you eliminate hepatitis A among children, the adults don't get it either. That's called herd immunity. You immunize the critical uh, proportion of the population, and even those who are not immunized directly benefit. As one of my friends said, oh, two for the price of one. Very nice. And so this has been a stunningly successful national immunization program for all intents and purposes, nearly eliminating a heretofore common infection. So, I call that a success. This is just one demonstration, but outbreak investigations can reveal new information that can indeed influence national public policy. As Louis Pasteur liked to say, chance favors the prepared mind. And the Vanderbilt Tennessee Department of Health Collaboration now has trained 22 EIS officers. I'll be in Atlanta later this month recruiting the 23rd. They've gone on to academia, to the CDC, to state public health departments, to the biomedical industry, and provided leadership. Some have joined Vanderbilt as trainees and then as faculty members. Some have stayed at the Tennessee Department of Health. So this collaboration in the supervision of EIS office in Tennessee has attracted talent to our community. Much of it has remained and others have gone on to leadership positions. As a consequence of this collaboration, I think it's fair to say that the Tennessee Department of Health is now ranked among the best communicable disease public health units in the country. This is something of which we can all be proud. It has been the basis for ongoing research collaborations between colleagues at the health department and colleagues here at Vanderbilt. And Tennessee Department of Health staff have uh, faculty appointments, volunteer faculty appointments uh, with us, and they are active teachers in our MPH program and in medicine, health, and society programs. So this has also been a demonstration of Vanderbilt's outreach into the community, providing service, support, and stimulus for good activities. Unconventional at first, it's now a model for others. I'd like to think that that's a success. If you need more information, on another occasion, over coffee or perhaps a glass of wine, I'll tell you a whole series of other stories which end up even talking about tuberculosis in elephants that have influenced the public health policy, both locally and nationally. I hope you all take pride in this activity and an ongoing example of collaboration between Vanderbilt and the community in which we reside. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Dr. Schaffner. <laughs>
for uh, that presentation. Uh, it's, it's exciting. I mean, there are things going on at this university that just are exciting. Um, so again, let me welcome you to the uh, faculty assembly. I wanted to spend a few minutes uh, just giving you an update on what the um, faculty senate's been doing and the issues that, um, that we see facing Vanderbilt uh, in the coming years. As you know, the um, faculty senate is organized into a, a set of committees uh, the Academic Policies and Services Committee, Faculty Life, Faculty Grievance, Strategic Planning and Academic Freedom, uh, Senate Affairs, and Student Life. Uh, this year, of course, we have also uh, commissioned a task force on alcohol and drug awareness and the issues that uh, students are facing on, on campus. Um, the issues that the Faculty Senate Committees have been addressing really range from uh, student health and safety issues to uh, faculty retirement from technology transfer and the cost of library journals to parental leave policies, from communication on campus among a variety of uh, university-wide committees and administrators to uh, faculty privacy issues, from resources for new mothers to online education. The, the range of topics that the Faculty Senate has been addressing is, is, is broad and of imminent concern to those uh, of us on, on the faculties. But two major issues really have kind of floated to the top of the agenda on the Faculty Senate. And those two agenda, uh, items are uh, the budgetary issues that Vanderbilt is facing and online education. The Chancellor, Provost, uh, and the Vice Chancellor for Health Affairs ha have really spent significant amounts of time trying to educate uh, the Executive Committee uh, and the Faculty Senate, um, and I dare say uh, the various schools and their faculties uh, about the issues uh, and the realities of the budgetary situation that uh, not only Vanderbilt is in, but the country and, and various other uh, institutions like Vanderbilt. Brett Sweet, who is our Vice Chancellor for uh, Finance and Chief Financial Officer, has done an outstanding job of communication, uh, not only about the budget, but about the way in which Vanderbilt is viewed by the outside financial world. As you know, there are a number of investment services that provide reports describing the financial health, risks, and opportunities of both public and private institutions, including universities. The report from Moody's Investor Services is particularly enlightening. Uh, if you're interested, uh, I can send you a copy of the report, or you can uh, request one from uh, Brett Sweet. Now, Moody's has assigned a rating to uh, Vanderbilt University of double A2. That's the third highest uh, rating that can be given to an organization. And that's really good. It implies that they have a high quality and very low credit risk. Quoting from the report, the A double A2 rating reflects Vanderbilt University's nationally prominent student market and research strengths the market and strength and geographic reach of its healthcare enterprise, healthy fundraising, a $4.9 billion of total cash and investments with healthy liquidity. Wow, and that's, that's really positive. But the report goes on to say, credit challenges include substantial exposure to patient care revenue and material exposure to interest rate swaps partially mitigated by careful management of the related risks. And that's a very great compliment to Brett Sweet and our, our group of administrators of our financial investments. But they go on to say again, challenges also include expectations for heightened competition for research awards. Now this is a great compliment to uh, Brett Sweet again and to Vanderbilt University on the strength of its uh, financial policies but it's also a wake-up call to the realities of the health care system costs in the United States, their effects on Vanderbilt University and other university hospitals, and the economic uncertainties related to sponsored research. So again, if you're interested in seeing the report in its entirety, I would be happy to send a copy of it to you. But it's enlightening for us to understand that it's not just Vanderbilt University and it's not just e each of us individually in our own departments but it is the broad scope of the financial marketplace that is putting pressure on Vanderbilt University for managing 
all of its financial expenditures. That's not easy for us to get our arms around. The second issue that has floated to the top of the agenda is online education. As you probably know, Vanderbilt is participating in a number of online education initiatives. Uh, there's a website that I've referenced here um, at Vanderbilt, uh, vanderbilt.edu slash educational uh, digital learning. It gives more detail about our initiatives, but I wanted to just give you a sense of the state of the university uh, with respect to online education and raise a few of the issues that are, are of concern. First of all, I'd like to acknowledge the uh, leadership of Associate Provost Cynthia Cyrus uh, being kind of the boots on the ground for our initial forays into this area. Currently, uh, Vanderbilt uh, has committed to offering five courses uh, through the Coursera platform. There are nearly 170,000 registrations for these five classes. Can you imagine? 170,000 people registering for five classes. Two of those courses are in progress with about 84,000 registrations. Two others will be offered this spring, and a last one is uh, yet to be scheduled, but is on the horizon. Now, Coursera was founded by a group of professors from Stanford University uh, and partners with approximately 60 of the best universities in the world to offer MOOCs, or massive open online courses that anyone can take without cost. Coursera boasts approximately three million registrations since its founding in 2011. And I am one of them. Actually, I'm two of them. My focus in taking the Coursera courses was to ask the question, what can I learn that will enhance my ability to teach at Vanderbilt? And I can tell you, taking an online course that you are currently teaching in the classroom is a really interesting experience. And I would encourage you to look at the courses that are offered by Coursera and see the approach that's taken in that environment to the kinds of material that you're delivering in the classroom. And ask how could you utilize facilities of that type within a classroom environment, potentially to help students that are, um, need remedial work or to provide some existing uh, additional support for those types of students. So in addition to the, the Coursera environment, uh, the School of Nursing offers a program in health systems management. So what are the issues that we see arising in this area? Well, several have been identified by the Strategic Planning and Academic Freedom Committee uh, um, in collaboration with the Chancellor's Committee on Social Media and with Cynthia Cyrus and the Provost's Office. And they include issues like, what are the implications for classroom teaching? Do we need uh, to, to help faculty understand how to use this type of media? For faculty that develop MOOCs, there are intellectual property issues. What can I use in the course that's going to be uh, publicly displayed and available? What about copyrighted materials that I'd like to use? What about the materials that I've developed and put significant amounts of time and effort into that now are available online, do, do I have any property rights to those? How do we select courses and how do we select faculty to teach those courses? How are we going to evaluate the courses? Well, clearly there are mechanisms that Coursera has in place, surveys of courses, but, but do, does that really get to the fundamentals of is the course delivering material in an appropriate way? How about granting credit? W will we grant credit to these courses? A at, at this point, uh, the Coursera courses are simply open, they're available, you can get a certificate that you've taken the course, but there are, are no credits, uh, university credits, associated with any of those courses. But at some point in the future, will there be? A a and if there are, how do we treat those kinds of courses? And finally, the implications for uh, faculty course loads. Currently, these courses are being offered on an overload basis, but should they be inloaded? And if they're inloaded, what implications does that have for our capacity uh, in our classroom experiences? So there are a number of questions that folks really kind of need to address. And I think I have a time for, for just a brief story. I have a son, proud of my son. He is currently enrolled in a um, 
Master of Educational Leadership Program at the University of, Misco of Wisconsin in Madison. Not a bad institution. I know of a couple of people that have graduated from there and have gone on to do some reasonable things. But he happens to be living in China. He's teaching advanced placement physics and advanced placement calculus in a Chinese high school in English for Chinese students who want to apply to uh, uh, Western universities. So he had to enroll in a program if he wanted a master's degree that was online. The University of Wisconsin's Master in Educational Leadership program is online. He takes two weeks during the summer to come for a residential experience. His goal, however, ultimately, is to engage in a PhD program in educational uh, uh, leadership. So my son, suppose, fills out his application for a PhD program at the Peabody School with an undergraduate degree in civil engineering from Cornell University and a master's degree in educational leadership from the University of Wisconsin, Madison, online. How do we evaluate that application? How do we determine if the online courses are the equivalent and led to the appropriate educational experience that we would like to have in a PhD student in our educational leadership programs here? I think there are a number of issues that we're going to be facing. And the train is moving. Online education is going along. We've got to figure out how we ought to deal with it, what place it should have in our curriculum, and how we ought to manage those programs. So I would invite you, uh, if you have ideas, suggestions, comments, criticisms, that you contact um, us on the executive committee or any of your uh, faculty senators to express those ideas and to help us to understand how we can help Vanderbilt through each of these issues. At this time, uh, I'd like to ask uh, Chancellor uh, Zeppos if he would take the podium to announce the recipients of the university awards. Thank you, Sal. <laughs> Can I? Sh <laughs> thank you. It's great to be here, and thank Mark Waite for uh, offering us this lovely gathering place for this uh, 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 great get together. Uh, and thank you, Sal, for your insights on health care and the changing world of online education and for your great work as chair of the Senate. Uh, I also want to thank Bill Schaffner, the most comforting human being in America. Uh, uh, he is the go-to person whenever there really is the kind of frightening challenge that we see increasingly in the world uh, and a, f uh, a force of, of dispassionate science and excellent public health when uh, we really need it. So um, I'm, I'm really appreciative of you uh, came out today to take time and we're stocking the buffet and we'll try to move this along as, as quickly as we can. Uh, but um, I know how busy you all are. You've got piles of paper that are on your desks waiting to be graded. I've got them myself. Um, the schedules are very, very hectic and harried and you have many, many things to do. You're sprinting toward the end of the semester commencement and uh, uh, grading your exams and hopefully going on to do wonderful things this summer. But this is a time to come out and honor our colleagues for their amazing achievements. Uh, these are special times we get together only twice a year and say thank you and recognize our great colleagues. Now, the way the nomination works, the process works is uh, nominations come forward. We work with the faculty, the deans, and so many others to select these uh, teaching and service awards. And I always love to uh, review the recommendations uh, and because it really gives me a, 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 a peek into the amazing things that are done in and out of the classroom and in the laboratories by my colleagues on campus. Uh, it also demonstrates just what a distinctive teaching, learning, discovering discovery environment we are. And so uh, I commend you all on creating the environment for so many of our colleagues to thrive, and I look forward to presenting these awards. Now, uh, Sal's going to assist me in these awards, and we have a special procedure we're using today because of this wonderful setting. And so when I call your name, 
stage right, stage left, and then you'll come on out, and we've got a check and a wonderful uh, 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 bowl or mint julep cup for you as well, or plate. So let's start. Today's first award is the Madison Surratt Prize for Excellence in Undergraduate Teaching, and it is determined in part by student ratings, outstanding efforts in classroom presentation, concern for student learning, and clarity and fairness in the criteria used for awarding grades. The recipient receives a cash prize of $2,500 and an engraved pewter cup. I am very pleased to present the Madison Surratt Prize to Tom Schwartz, Professor of History and Political Science. Tom, please join me on the stage. Tom joins, Tom, uh, I'm pleased to say that Tom joins me in the over two decade club at Vanderbilt with more than 20 years devoted to educating and mentoring our great students. He is a superb teacher and a major scholar in the field of United States diplomatic history who brings passion and insight to the study of foreign relations and international history into his classroom and to every, every course that he teaches. The students are drawn to Tom's survey and seminar classes which are distinguished by their relevance to the fundamental question of America's role in this complex world. Tom is a revered professor who pushes his students to find a deeper understanding of American foreign policy, and he is equally committed to preparing Vanderbilt students for future careers as he is shaping them as responsible, knowledgeable citizens. Praised by his department chair, Jim Epstein, as being without rival in terms of mentoring honor students. Tom holds the record for supervising, supervising more department honor students than any other member of the faculty. Tom, please accept my thanks for your incredible work and your devotion to teaching. Congratulations. Either way. Okay, next, I have the pleasure of presenting the Ellen Gregg Ingalls Award for Excellence in Classroom Teaching. Teaching. Now, this award, endowed by the Ingalls Foundation, recognizes exemplary teaching. The recipient is honored with a cash prize of $2,500 and an engraved pewter cup. The recipient is, uh, uh, nominees for this prize are ranked by students on the basis of clarity and fairness of criteria for awarding grades, organization, and engagement in the classroom, as well as availability uh, and willingness to meet outside of the classroom. The recipient of this year's Ellen Gregg Ingalls Award, I'm very pleased to say, is Ken Catania. Now, unfortunately, unfortunately, and this will come as no surprise to those of us who know Ken and his remarkable work pretty well, that he is not able to be with us today because he is on an animal collecting trip to get star-nosed mole pups. And if you think this is fool's gold, just keep track of the New York Times and nature and science and see the sort of work that our colleague Ken Catania does. This is the time of the year they're actually born. And the selection and adoption season is very short. <laughs> now, since Ken can't be with us, I've asked Dean Carol Endeavor to come up and accept this award on Ken's behalf. Carolyn, there you are. Let's come on, Carolyn. Yeah. Uh, let me just tell you a little bit about Ken. Uh, Stevenson, professor of biological sciences, recipient of a, uh, a 2013 National Academy of Sciences Pradle Research Award. And if you ever uh, want to know what a genius looks like, look at Ken. He's won the MacArthur Genius Award. Uh, his work has led to fundamental breakthroughs in the science of sensory perception, and he has been featured, as I said, by the New York Times and national television news outlets. I can personally attest from the emails that my friend Ken sends me uh, uh, regularly, including an invitation to come witness the birth of a clutch of alligators hatching in his laboratory, uh, to receiving a scanned electron microscope image of a cicada magnified 100 times, as if I had not seen enough of them. <laughs> this is teaching that excites 
and engages. If it doesn't, call Corey Slovis in ER to get over to his classroom. Now, the students recognize Ken's brilliance, and his department chair, Bubba Singleton, points out that his numerical evaluations for Ken's classes are always the highest of any faculty member within biological sciences. And the student comments, no surprise, equally glowing. In fact, for his neurobiology behavior course, Bubba has the dilemma of increasing the cap and finding a larger room each year, and apparently more alligators and star-nosed moles. Now, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the exciting promise that Ken's work holds for the uh, discovery of new treatments in disease and in medical science. For his incredible teaching skills, for these breakthroughs in discovery, for inspiring students to post facts about water shrews, worms, zebrafish on their Facebook pages, it is my great pleasure to give the Madison Surratt Prize for Excellence in Undergraduate Teaching to Ken and have it accepted on Carolyn's behalf. Let's give Ken a round of applause. Created to honor the legacy of Chancellor Harvey Branscombe, the Branscombe Award comes with a cash award of 2,500 and an engraved silver tray, an official designation as the Harvey Branscombe Distinguished Professor for One Academic Years. This prize honors creative scholarship, which may take the form of accomplishments in the creative arts as well as artistic performance, stimulating and inspiring teaching that results in learning of the highest order and service to students, colleagues, the university at large, and importantly, society at large. This year's Harvey Branscombe Distinguished Professor Award goes to Donna Ford, Professor of Special Education. Donna, will you please join me on the stage? Donna is a remarkable scholar who has earned the respect of her academic peers and the greater community for combining her scholarship with excellence in undergraduate teaching to make a profound impact in many young lives. Her research takes a very hard look at the systemic problems of racial inequality in education with a particular focus on the achievement gap that divides minority students from their higher achieving white peers. Known widely as an expert in gifted education, Donna is a champion for underrepresented minority students in gifted education programs and in creating programs that serve this important and often overlooked population. Along with Gilman Whiting, she established the Summer Scholar Identity Institute, which with the collaborative efforts of 100 black men of Middle Tennessee enrolls 100 black teenage males to provide character building opportunities and develop academic self-confidence and success-oriented attitudes and behaviors. Donna's exemplary service and teaching adds great strength and uh, pride to our university community. In recognition of her establishment of the Vanderbilt Achievement Gap Project, her year-long seminar, ex seminar exam examining this subject at the Robert Penn Warren Center and her advisory roles within the greater community. It is my great honor to present this year's Harvey Branscombe Distinguished Professor Award to our colleague, Donna Ford. Congratulations, Donna. <laughs> The Alexander Hurd Distinguished Service Professor Award was created to honor Chancellor Hurd's leadership and life's work. The award recognizes scholarship that increases and informs our understanding of the problems confronting contemporary society. In the spirit of Chancellor Hurd's societal concern and the civil rights advancements that occurred during his watch, the award honors faculty members who seek, to propose, who seek and propose solutions to issues that confront humanity. The recipient carries the title Alexander Hurd Distinguished Service Professor Award for one year, receives a cash award of $2,500 and an engraved silver tray. It is with a tremendous sense of admiration that I present this year's Hurd Award to our colleague Greg Bars, Associate Professor of Musicology, Associate Professor of Anthropology, 
and Associate Professor of Music and Religion. Greg, please join me on this stage. Greg has rendered an incredible service to the people of Africa through HIV AIDS education. As noted by his colleague and ethnomusicologist counterpart at Brown, Greg discovered that the most effective way to get the word out in Uganda about how to prevent HIV AIDS was not through leaflets, government media, clinics, or public forums, but rather through music. Observing that women were already spreading the word on a small scale about HIV AIDS by making up lyrics, Greg Moore formally initiated a program to encourage education through song. This movement eventually caught on throughout the continent, gaining traction to the point that it has now become public policy. Through such projects as the monograph, Singing for Life, HIV, AIDS, and Music in Uganda, and his book, The Culture of AIDS in Africa, he has managed to provide HIV positive people a voice and an outlet to tell their stories with the greater world. In true interdisciplinary fashion, with boldness, Greg has pioneered the field of medical ethnomusicology, providing MDs working in global health with a cultural perspective that forges immediate connections with patients. His work encompasses all media, and I'm proud to say his CD has even received a Grammy nomination. For his incredible commitment to humanity, I am very pleased to present Greg with the Alexander Heard Distinguished Service Professor Award. Congratulations, Greg. Today's final award is Joe B. Wyatt Distinguished University Professor Award. This award recognizes accomplishments that span multiple academic disciplines and honors the development of significant new knowledge from research or exemplary innovations in teaching. The recipient carries the title Joe B. Wyatt Distinguished University Professor for one year and receives a $2,500 cash award in an engraved silver tray. I am very pleased to present this year's Joe B. Wyatt Distinguished University Professor Award to our good friend and colleague, Tom Dillahay, Rebecca Webb Wilson University Distinguished Professor of Anthropology, Religion, and Culture. Tom, will you join me? Now, Tom's work, uh, just like so many of our faculty and recipients, has earned him many accolades and is, 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 is uh, phenomenally interesting. He's been elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. He's garnered numerous other honors from UNESCO and governments and universities in France, Peru, Chile, and the United States. His record of accomplishment as a researcher, teacher, and mentor spans many disciplines in several continents. He truly exemplifies the spirit of the Joe B. Wyatt Award. Tom is internationally renowned for his excavations at Monte Verde, of the oldest human habitation in the Western Hemisphere. Radiocarbon dates from these discovers, discoveries upended the long-held idea that the Americas' earliest inhabitants crossed the Bering Strait about 12,000 BCE. In fact, Tom's evidence sheds light that people were living in South America 8,000 miles from the Bering Strait at least a thousand years earlier. A seminal discovery like this is more than sufficient to secure a researcher's position among the very top ranks of world scientists. However, Tom was not content to stop there. He went on to undertake a series of ambitious projects in Peru and Chile, where his detective work focused on deciphering ancient patterns of migration, plant domestication, and the political and economic cultures of ancient communities. For his groundbreaking research, his work with Chilean human rights attorneys that lays the groundwork for legal recognition of native people's future survival and for his service in numerous roles to this university. I am very pleased to present to our colleague Tom, the Joe B. Wyas Distinguished University Professor. Congratulations, Tom.
Now please join me in applauding all these deserving award winners. Well, it's a few comments for me, and then we'll go out and enjoy good company and good food and good drink. And uh, I always enjoy this time. And, uh, you know, I remember as a young kid, I used to say to my mother, you know, I had to speak in class or something like that. And she, I'd, she, I'd say, well, how do I not get nervous or how do I avoid, you know, getting distracted by people in the audience? And she said, just focus on one person right in the middle and pretend you're having a conversation with that person. And I thought, what great advice. And I used it as a lawyer and a teacher. And now, John Gore, you and I are going to have a conversation. <laughs> now, these awards really, in a basic way, reaffirm our mission to educate, discover, and to serve and to teach. I'm grateful for all you do to burnish the reputation of Vanderbilt. And I really feel privileged to serve as your chancellor. Now, as I am uh, uh, obliged and love doing, I'd love to give you my report on the state of the university. Vanderbilt continues to do exceptionally well in a challenging environment. The only easy thing these days is to make a list of the obstacles we face. Here are a few fiscal cliffs that remind us, and certainly me, of an old Roadrunner cartoon. We all know the cliff is coming. We feel our legs wheeling in space only when it might be too late. Blunt and disproportionate cuts in science, research, and healthcare that diminish our nation's future innovation and our competitiveness. Vanderbilt's commitment to providing medical care for all remains unyielding, but the shifting to us of a steep rise in medical care for the uninsured tests us in new ways. Regulatory burdens on all parts of our mission are added and proposed daily without in any way connecting the dots to the costs they impose. A deluge of calls, calls impose, uh, seek to impose narrow vocational rules of accountability that are at odds with the broader skills of critical thinking, leadership, and lifelong learning that makes the American college experience distinctive and the world's envy. Our economy is still in a fragile recovery, and now we have gone from worrying about Greece to now blaming Cyprus. I just wish someone would leave my ancestral homes alone. <laughs> Crete will be next. Despite this list of woes, our university continues to excel in all areas of research, discovery, service, and education. We again see record number of applications for our undergraduate and graduate programs. We had over 31,000 applications for our 1,550 undergraduate spots. Our admit rate on regular decision was hovering around 10%. Our fundraising for the first six months of the fiscal year is exceptional. Our faculty recruiting and retention remains vibrant, and while resources remain very tight and tough decisions have to be made, I am confident that we are setting our priorities right and can, and can continue to do so. We have challenges, but fortunately, we at Vanderbilt can face them with optimism. A walk across the campus today, a visit to classroom or research labs, reveals a university humming with tremendous momentum, warmth, and strength. Thousands of diverse young people are visiting our campus as high school students, recently admitted to Vanderbilt or visiting for the first time as a college sophomore or junior. They sit in classes with lively and meaningful discussions about the most important questions. They talk to engaged and committed faculty who discuss research opportunities. They gaze up at the two new residential colleges, Moore and Warren, and imagine themselves as a future Nobelist in medicine, like Stanford Moore, or a Pulitzer Prize winner, like Robert Penn Warren. Faculty of exceptional ability are accepting our offers to join our academic community. Their eye is not on Washington, D.C. and the problems we face, but on the transformative work they can do here as professors. I firmly believe that this is not the time to succumb to pessimism. It's time to look forward and to see our challenges as a call to further action. This past year, our faculties have been engaged in discussions about big new ideas, truly big problems we can solve. I'm inspired by the breadth 
and depth of the faculty's commitment and creativity. Yes, we are a realistic group. We acknowledge the problems we face, but we fix our sights on how to excel, to redefine our goals and mission, and to make a global impact. I've heard and seen an eagerness among my colleagues to define, to reinvent the research university of the 21st century. Throughout the year, as I have listened and learned, four ideas and themes seem to have emerged. They go to the heart of our mission and our future strategy. First, it is clear we are moving even faster towards a world of interdisciplinary work and transinstitutional connections. We must develop and invest in new intersections and nourish and build on our existing successes. Our investments in cross-disciplinary programs such as nanoscience, medicine, health, and society, Latin American studies, law and economics, neuroscience, chemical biology and drug discovery, and so many others demonstrate our ability to build outstanding programs across fields. We have done this importantly while greatly strengthening our core faculty in our faculty in the core departments in all schools. Now is the time to forge new connections across our campus and declare that in these new areas we at Vanderbilt will cooperate, collaborate, discover, and achieve in ways that only a truly collegial community of scholars can do. The impact on these new connections will define us. They will pave the way for new undergraduate curriculum, enrich and make better our graduate programs, guide our faculty in capital investment, and allow Vanderbilt, most importantly, to ask and answer questions that are new with better answers. Second, Vanderbilt must define and we must create the new, bold undergraduate experience set in a university residential setting. Our commitment to access, merit, the American dream is essential. We will not back off that, and we are now seeing the results of acting on our values. The talent, diversity, and the human potential of all of our current students present us with amazing opportunities. New technologies will always inform learning and teaching. However, we are one of a very small number of universities that can create an undergraduate experience that is residential, that focuses on faculty-student interaction in and out of the classroom, that is research-based and looks at creativity and innovation as something we do every day in all that we see on campus, and is focused on educating the whole person. In forging this undergraduate experience, we must offer a self-confident and self-aware answer to this compelling question. What are the human and intellectual qualities we wish our students to carry with them for our lives? Our four years with them are to prepare them for decades ahead, decades ahead, as good citizens, innovators, creative contributors, and global leaders. Our breadth and balance in science, engineering, the humanities, social sciences, it's simply not found at all the great research universities. Let us take the lead to create this distinctive learning environment and define the liberal arts undergraduate experience for the 21st century. Third, as Sal mentioned, we're talking a lot about new learning technologies, social media, and how it should be a source of creativity and innovation for students, faculty, and our staff on campus. As a research university, we, we should embrace this. We have amazing opportunities to question, develop, validate, invalidate, deploy these new ideas side by side with the best students in the world. They can improve and make better what we do every day. And this holds the potential for reaching millions of people around the world who thirst for access to knowledge and free thought. Fourth, we must all commit to be the university that leads in solving our nation's health care problems. Our university and nation see every day the pain and cost of an ineffective and just disjointed health care system that manages simultaneously to grossly overspend and grossly underspend at the same time. No other university, no other university is as uniquely positioned as we are to take on this bold challenge. We have outstanding clinical care. We have amazing biomedical sciences. We have physicians, scientists, nurses who are dedicated to a new and different way 
of caring for everybody. What is distinctive, however, is the eagerness of our medical staff, scientists, and leadership to partner with engineers, humanists, sociologists, economists, anthropologists, and every other field to care for the whole person and address the environment in which care occurs. This is not easy work, especially when funding is cut and when there's so many obstacles. But the impact and stakes for Vanderbilt in our society are enormous. We simply must take this on. So taking on these four areas, new transinstitutional programs that strengthen our research, graduate and undergraduate programs, defining the residential research-based liberal arts education for the 21st century, innovating in new technologies for teaching and discovery, developing a comprehensive set of solutions for healthcare, they are not easy challenges. They go to the sustenance and greatness of the, American, of, the, of the American Research University. They'll require your engagement, and most importantly, your ideas and your leadership. They will also require more resources. Our progress over the past five years has been possible because of a focus on setting priorities and making tough financial trade-offs that continue. We have also been fortunate to receive generous philanthropic support. We will always strive to budget prudently but we will also need significant philanthropic support to achieve our goals and to secure our future. We must continue these conversations as a scholarly community cares deeply about education and research. I will soon be appointing a strategic planning group to discuss and recommend to me and a series of other groups on these issues to recommend to me and the Board of Trust areas for future focus and substantial investment. Additionally, over the next year, we must undertake a campus-wide conversation on our priorities, our strategies, and test the outcome of this discussion with our key supporters and our board while constructing and getting ready for our next capital campaign. I look forward with great excitement and anticipation to the work, of the work ahead. I know it won't be easy. Thank you for all you do for Vanderbilt, and most importantly, for allowing me the privilege of serving as your chancellor. Thank you very much.